Hey, this is not your average weekly announcement video. This is a welcome video to Courtney Sanford, our new children's ministry director. We want to tell you, Courtney, all the amazing things that are coming up. Like for example, on October the 30th, it is the last Sunday in October, we're having Link Sunday, and that is where we do a service project together. And every family is gonna get a $25 Walmart gift card. We're going to the neighborhood Walmart and we're shopping to get food for Backpack Beginnings. I called them and their donations have been down 40% the last several months. So we're gonna build their supplies up so they can get food to kids who need them during the week. And Courtney, guess what? On October 29th, we have our fall festival. It's our biggest outreach ministry of the year. It takes place right here in this parking lot. And it has games and trunk or treat and food and lots of people from our community. It's from 11 to one and we still need volunteers. So if you want to decorate your car for a trunk or treat, or you would like to man a game or help with the food, contact the church office to get plugged in for our fall festival. Welcome, Courtney. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're so excited you're joining the team and the family. And we're gonna give you one of these cool mugs when you get here, so look forward to that. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Let's stand and do our call to worship together. The choir is going to sing the first verse. I have a little something to share in between and then we'll all join together in repeating the first verse of blessed be the tie that binds. It's number 557 in your bullets, I mean in your hymnal. I did a little bit of research and found out that it was incredibly relevant to this week, which is Clergy Appreciation Day and also um, the beginning of our Family Matters series. So here's a little bit about Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. In the 1700s, a pastor named John Fawcett was called to a small, poor country church in um, Yorkshire. And he served there for a long time, but eventually he was called to serve a larger church, a more well researched resourced church, a city church. And on the day he was supposed to leave, the people of his small church, the wagons were packed and he was ready to go, begged him to please stay. And he did. And he stayed there through the end of his career with the people who loved him well and with those he had come to call family. And it's just a great testament to the ties that bind us together. And no matter what size you are, we are God's family still. Let's sing verse one together. <clears throat> Welcome. We're glad you're worshiping with us, and we welcome our online viewers as well. We're glad you're worshiping with us today. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill us once more. Renew us. Comfort us. Grant us wisdom. Equip us. Strengthen us. Holy Spirit, come. As we are drawing near to you in worship today, draw near to us and guide us in the steps that honor you. Amen. 
Our hymn of praise is number 539, O Spirit of the Living God. Let's sing together. of faith is printed in your bulletin. Let's affirm our faith together using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. children's message, you're invited to greet your neighbors and pass the peace of Christ.
Good morning, good morning. I'm certainly glad to see all of you here this morning in the church with us. If you look right up at the camera and wave to all of our friends who are joining us online, we're glad that you are here uh, joining us as well. I have a question for you guys this morning. Here's the question. What are some reasons or occasions that families get together? Christmas. Yeah, families get together Christmas. They sure do and celebrate, maybe swap gifts sometime. Thanksgiving. Yep, and Thanksgiving. Yes, ma'am. Easter, yeah, we get together. And church, families get together and come to church together. That's right. There's a lot of reasons that family kind of gathered. I don't know about you, but when I was your age, when we gathered for things like Christmas and Thanksgiving, we had what was called the kids' table. And that's where all the kids sat together table, and it was the fun table, and it was the rowdy table, and we kind of was loud. And I remember the first time that I had to join the adult table, and it was a very sad day. <laughs> very, I had to try to behave and stuff like that. I was probably, I don't know, 25 maybe <laughs> is when I made that transition. But here's the thing I want to share with you this morning is that families are a great thing to have, right? And so we're starting a series today called Family Matters. Families can help us. So if we're having a good day or we're celebrating something, it's great to have family around to help you celebrate, right, and to be excited for you. But also, if we're having a bad day or something's going wrong, it is great to have family be there with you to help you through the bad time. Families are awesome. But did you know that not only do you have your family family, but you also have your church family? We are brothers and sisters in Christ, and so we are a family. And we get to have a celebration, a gathering every Sunday. We get to get together with our church family like we're doing right now. And I hope that you get excited on Sunday mornings to come and be with your church family. And that if you're having a good day, your church family will help you celebrate. And if you're having a hard day, your church family will help you get through that hard day and make things better. And then you get to do that for other people in the church. You can help them. Can we have a prayer together? All right, pray after me. Dear God, thank you so much for giving us our families and our church families. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining me. During the hymn for reflection, we invite you to use this time as the time of giving in our service. There are a few ways to do that. You can use the QR code in your bulletin or on the screen if you're worshiping with us online. You can use our PayPal handle or the um, offering boxes in the narthex on your way out into the world. But we encourage you to be in a spirit of giving and a spirit of prayer during our hymn for reflection. Our hymn for reflection is number 92, For the Beauty of the Earth. Let's stand and sing together. We're going to sing four verses, and I'll call them as we go. Let's sing.
You may be seated. As we turn to our prayer time, I do remind our viewers online that you can send in a prayer request and our staff will make sure to pray for that request in the coming week. I also want to note that the beautiful flowers on the altar today are dedicated to the glory of God and given in loving memory to the life of Ralph Gordon Hooks by his daughter, Laura Hooks Moore, and they are quite beautiful. We appreciate them. I think for our prayer time today, we... Um, Content, need to continue praying for all of those recovering from just such a huge hurricane, Hurricane Ian, and just the hurricanes that have come through, Puerto Rico and Cuba and Florida and North Carolina, South Carolina. I think it hit, you know, really hard. So many people recovering right now. So keep watching The Voice and others for ways that we might reach out and help. But that's kind of our, one of our big concerns today and a concern for a whole world that just seems to be been on war and, and just, you know, so, so broken right now. So we need to pray for our larger human family and our own church family. Please continue to pray for all of those that are on our prayer list here in your bulletin. And um, you will have, and I'll remind you again at the end of the service, you got today a, a book called A Prayer Planner. We're going to have 40 days of prayer in action. It starts today. So I really hope that everybody will take that home. There's a children's version as well. Um, and so it's so important that we pray for each other on a regular basis and remember and encourage each other. So it's praying for our church family, and it keeps us strong to remember that we're supposed to be a light around the world as well. So I encourage you and invite you to take that home today. Our choir is going to call us to prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful God, you are the source of all that makes life possible and the giver of all that makes life good. We can just come before you today in humble thanksgiving and gratitude for gifts more than we can enumerate, that our souls woke up this morning and that we're here for life itself, every breath, every step, for forgiveness, for comfort, for courage, for hope, that you are always with us and never leave us. Gracious God, we could never thank you enough. But we know that we come in a very broken state as a human family, as a church family, as biological families, communities. We know that we come before you and there's much that, much that still needs healing. We all need you so much. So Lord, we lift up today all of the people that have been affected by Hurricane Ian and Hurricane Fiona before that, the, and, and all the people that have lost their businesses and their homes and especially those who have lost loved ones. We pray that you give them a great courage and a divine measure of comfort in this time of grieving. We pray for all of the recovery and rebuilding efforts. And Lord, we can't thank you enough for those who are willing to sacrifice their time, sometimes even their lives, to rescue others and to help rebuild. But we pray for each and every one who has suffered so much from these hurricanes. We pray for our world that seems still bent on war. We pray for our world, Lord, that seems still bent on war. We pray that you, in the ways you choose to govern, will lessen the power and influence of those that do not value the sacredness of life and that are not seeking you and your wisdom and your equipping. 
And we pray that you raise up and increase the power and influence of those that are seeking you and your wisdom and value all of life and all of creation. We need you, Lord. We need you. We pray, O oh Lord, for every effort, every nonprofit, and every effort from church families across the globe, O oh Lord, to end poverty, to care for those people who don't have a voice, the least and the lost among us. Lord, we pray for our church family today, the Universal Church, the Muir's Chapel Church, for all of us, Lord, that you are will come in and fill us and grant us wisdom and equipping. Grant us kindness and love. Fill us with your loving, compassionate spirit. Transform us where we need to be tra transformed. Correct us where we need to be corrected. Grow us where we need to grow. Change us where we need changing. Forgive us, O oh Lord, that we will be your people. We pray for our biological families, O oh Lord, today. We know that families struggle. They struggle in so many different ways. You see all of those ways, Lord, where there's brokenness, where there's broken relationships, where there's unemployment, um, where there is rebellion, where there are just so many needs. Lord, you know that those needs look so different in every family, where there's illness, where there have been accidents and disabilities, where caregiving needs are great. Lord, there's so many different needs, so we pray for our families. We pray for healing. We pray for courage. We pray for day-to-day -day spiritual strength. Lord, come and help us and strengthen us and comfort us and teach us. And trusting in your love and forgiveness, we pray the prayer you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Good morning. Good morning. You know, if I had to make a list of um, what I consider to be the most unappreciated jobs today, uh, it would include things like uh, waiters, garbage men, police officers, nurses, uh, caregivers, uh, in general, anybody in the service industry tends to be in a position that's, that's underappreciated. I would also include pastors, pastors on that list. Um, just like many of us, they have to deal with, with pressures and, and they have to deal with overwhelming responsibilities. They have to deal with tension in their jobs. Uh, they're also called to be involved in the lives of their congregations, congregations that at times can have an endless, endless list of demands. Pastors are asked to put aside their own lives on behalf of serving and treating the spiritual health and needs of others. On the second Sunday of October, Pastor Appreciation Day is celebrated. In 1 Timothy, Paul began this celebration or this concept of, of clergy appreciation when he, when he stated that the elders of the church are worthy of double honor and reiterated this idea in, in 1 Thessalonians when he stated that those who work hard among us should be held in the highest regard for their work. This idea became Clergy Appreciation Month. In 1992, it was established by, by pastors and religious workers. And as you see in our bulletin today, here at Muir's Chapel, October is Staff Appreciation Month. But today, we want to take the time to show our deepest appreciation and to show our gratitude for our pastor and the work she does for our church and congregation. So, Pastor Brenda, on behalf of the staff parish, uh, Pastor of Parish Relations Committee and the congregation of Muir's Chapel, we thank you. We thank you for being our pastor. We thank you for the word you spread and, and the lives you touch. We thank you for your empathy and your compassion that, that's given whenever we need it. We thank you for your spiritual guidance and leadership, and we thank you for letting God minister through you. So please accept this in deep and true appreciation for the things you do for your staff and for you do for our congregation. You are greatly, greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. So they, they are not appearing in this video. What's your whole name? Jonah Michael Allred. Anything else you want to tell me? Yes. So for anybody that knows us, we play music a lot. Yeah. <laughs> not just at church. We've got groups that we play with. Uh, we've got pianos, drums. I'm not sure if you can hear right now. Jonah's banging on some drums. Anything, strings, a box, we, we can we, we, we play it. Also, I'm um, really into Halloween, mm -hmm. Happy October, and um, board gaming, tabletop games. Not just Monopoly. No. <laughs> I think there's a picture you can see.
are called bananagrams. What do you do with this? Uh, make words. I said make words. Yeah. Alan's really into cooking and I like to run. Gosh, that drumming is so loud. Um, so what is the role of faith in my life and family? Um, well, faith has always been a big part of, of my life and I think Alan and Stewie both, both grew up in Christian families and so now um, the role of faith I think for me and for us is just keep passing it on to our kids and teaching our kids that um, we love them, that Jesus loves them, and that they always um, have a home in the family of God. And then I know that for me, through helping develop the faith of Jonah and Daniel, that my faith has grown deeper also. How did you come to be at Mirror's Chapel? Well, that's an easy one, <laughs> because Lauren got a job at Mirror's Chapel. Um, and you know, it, it sort of took a while uh, to sort of get enmeshed at Moore's Chapel. Um, you know, at the time we were newly married, sort of before kids, uh, sort of trying to figure out in our lives where we're, you know, we'll go, what we're going, what we're doing, what we want to do when we grow up, but still uh, to a certain degree. And the good thing about that is Moore's Chapel was always a receptive place. Um, you know, it's uh, particularly for for a young family for people starting out it's important to have connections connections to people your age but you know people who will just take you in and, and love you no matter what stage you are in life or what stage they are um, you know in your chapel there's great folks who have years of wisdom and experience and um, I, I'd say more than any church that I've ever attended Mir's chapel uh, has always just been welcoming it's been um, nice to grow our family at your chapel you know both our kids were born since we've been here and they're baptized in the sanctuary and have been loved on by all of you for their whole lives and that's a really a really special thing i think watching your chapel love our kids has been so incredibly important to us and that's um it's one of the reasons we love it so yeah i you know i think there's been uh like no other time in my life it's been so important to have a community. Um, and that's a powerful thing, right? People who come together um, in Jesus' name to, to do work. All of these things that um, really, I, I've sort of jumped in and been a part of for the first time in my life. And I think it's important that, you know, I, you know our kids just jump in and <laughs> they understand the church as a place that they, they want to go. They want to go to Mirror's Chapel. They, uh, it's just a home for them and they, they understand that already. We are so thankful to have the Allred family as a part of our church family. And I, I really much prefer calling October as Staff Appreciation Month, and I would add Congregational Appreciation Month. I think we need a whole month just for y'all um, because I'm the one that really needs to say thank you. But I do want to say thank you first to Lauren for all these incredible videos we see, announcement videos and everything. She puts a lot of time into that and what a talent she has for that. So let's just thank her a little bit for that. And for the staff that's here, I'll say thank you for, to Lauren and Kenny and, and Brian and Jalen, who's back there. Um, and I don't know if Blake's back or not. I don't see Blake right now. Um, and of course, then we have Sandy Allison and Kim. And just, you know, make sure to say thank you to them because they're all amazing and just do so much. And thank you to all of you um, who share your gifts and your time and your talents. We are adding to staff. Um, uh, Courtney's not quite here yet. We have... Um, are in the process this week of finalizing hiring Courtney Sanford as a, a children's minister. Um, so when she's, you know, she'll start soon, and the Sunday she starts, we'll introduce her and, and everybody get to know her a little bit better. 
our scripture. You can find it in the bulletin if you want to read along that way or if you have another way you want to follow along. First Corinthians 12, starting with verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that we think less honorable we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, given the greater honor to the inferior member, so that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If a member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work powerful deeds? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Be Let us pray. Lord, speak through me. If necessary, speak in spite of me. And always speak beyond me. Amen. Families. We have our biological families. We have the church family. We have the human family. If you noticed, I tried to separate all of those in our prayer this morning. Um, think about it. Every big fun event like weddings or our bicentennial homecoming or Independence Day celebrations, they bring with them joy and fellowship. And most of the time, they bring with them a little chaos and hilarity, too, when you're trying to make it all work. And every time you have those special occasions, it's a reminder of how much we mean to each other and how much we need each other. And likewise, every tragic event or every time of struggle, every accident, every illness, every Category 4 hurricane, you know, brings with it a lot of chaos, but also the reminder of how much we mean to each other and need each other. Now, the stories that are already circulating from Her Hurricane Ian leave no doubt on the value of family in many different ways. I don't know how many of you are following some of these stories. I kind of pick up on a story now and again since the hurricane. And the story that most gripped my heart was of Darcy Bishop and her two brothers. Darcy has spent most of her life taking care of her brothers, both of whom have cerebral palsy and they're now in wheelchairs. So every day, it's a major effort. She just lives with them, and she takes care of them every day. And when the hurricane predictions started coming in, they did not think they were in the direct path. And it's really hard for them to move or go anywhere, so they decided to stay at home. Well, they ended up really being close to the direct path and in, in extreme danger. Um, now, I've never been caught in a flash flood. Has anybody here in here ever been caught in a flash flood before? I see a few people that have. So I don't know exactly what that's like, but she described it as, you know, that the water went from being ankle deep to knee deep inside her house in five minutes. Can you imagine that? Like it just literally flooding in your house in five minutes. So they had a second story, but both brothers were in the wheelchair and they hadn't been upstairs in years. 
but somehow or another she managed to get them out of the wheelchair and just kind of bump up the steps. She couldn't get them all the way up, but she got them high enough up that they lived. You know, because of the water came in really high in the house, but they lived because it was too late for 911 to get there. But I just, when I was hearing that story and thinking about that story, I was thinking of the power, the power of sacrifice and commitment and love in that family that she gave her whole life to those brothers. And she was willing to die with them if that's what she needed to do when they stayed there in the hurricane. Thankfully, they lived. And families, when we think about them, they come in all shapes and sizes. Large families, small families, blended families, broken families. Some families are headed by a grandparent. Some families are headed by an aunt and uncle. Sometimes our families are not even biological. They're just our friends. We have a great circle of friends, and they serve as our families. We can say that for every family, there are times that it's chaotic. At least, you know, if there's anybody in here that's never had a time of chaos or dysfunction, you can come tell me afterwards and we'll kind of do a story on it because I don't think that I know any families that haven't at some point or another had some dysfunction or some chaos because it's hard. You know, families are hard and relationships are hard. But what we can say about every family is that it matters. You know, it matters what happens. It matters how we treat each other. It matters that everyone has a voice and is treated with respect. It matters that everyone feels safe and loved and connected. It matters that everyone can grow and develop and become the person they're meant to be. It matters what kind of neighbors we are to others. Our scripture this morning is one of the well-known passages where Paul compares the church, the church family, to the body of Christ. Now, it's one of the most famous metaphors in all of Christianity, and what I've been trying to return to this fall are just some key scriptures, and this one's key to our identity. But now, Paul wrote this church, but, you know, take the letters, 1 and 2 Corinthians. Why did Paul need to write this church to these families? Why did he need to talk about that? Because they messed up a lot. They messed up a lot, and they needed some guidance, and they needed some help along the way, which most all of us do. They had tensions along the way, and they needed some help. Um, Just as today, churches are struggling with some divisive issues, families are struggling with lots of different things. Um, Yesterday, I went to a wedding, and uh, it was an outdoor wedding, and the pastor was counting on using his phone to read the scripture. Well, it was an outdoor wedding far away from everything, and guess what? There was no connection anywhere, and there was no reading the scripture over your phone, and he didn't bring his Bible with him. And, and so, but the scripture was 1 Corinthians 13, the chapter right after this, where Paul is still trying to talk to the people at Corinth. Now, that's called the love chapter. Now, when we think of that, we think of that chapter as being used at weddings, which we do, but that's not what it was written for. It was written for the church family and about their love for each other. It wasn't written about the the, the biological family. It was written for the church family and their love for each other and how they cared for each other. But I was really proud of the minister. He, I think he got most of it right, done it by memory. I was sitting there in, in my outdoor chair seeing if I could recite it by memory. I think I missed a few lines, but I got most of it. <laughs> but, he, but he did pretty good. Um, but... What is clearly paramount is that our church family can play a significant role in how we can grow in all of our relationships, whether it's with our nuclear families, with our communities, with our human families. It's it's meant to be a place where we learn, where we learn about how to care for each other and we learn how to relate and learn how to grow. And the big difference between this body of Christ and the church family and all the other families we might ever talk about is that it doesn't start with us. It doesn't start with us. We need to get that right. It starts with Christ. We are the body of Christ. Christ is the head of the family. We are members of the family and we grow and develop by the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is Christ in us. Paul wrote in verse 13, For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were made to drink of one spirit. Now, drinking of a spirit sounds a little strange, so you have to remember that Paul's language is a little lofty and it's a little theological at times, but it's this verse 
that makes our church family different from all other family units. And that gives us a lot of hope. Because we're not doing this on our own strength, and our own resources, and our own wisdom. Christ is, is the head of the family, but Christ is not just the head of the family. Christ is with us. Christ is within us. That's what the Holy Spirit is. Christ strengthens us. Christ gives us gifts. Christ grows us. Christ shows us how we're meant to treat one another. Christ grants us purpose. This is what makes us different. Christ is not just the head of the family. He's with us. He's within us. He strengthens us. He grants us purpose. He grows us. So Paul teaches us first and foremost that this is an incredible body to belong to because Christ is with us and we're not navigating it on our own. Which sometimes we feel like we are doing in our own families or when we look around at the human family we wish sometimes that God would take more control. You know, because God gives us a great deal of freedom and sometimes we wish he wouldn't. You know, when we look around and see how broken things are. So then Paul teaches us two things about this. Diversity and interdependence. I've been blessed to meet a lot of families through years of ministry, and some of them seem to have a lot in common. They look alike. You know, they say they're sisters, and right away, I know they're sisters. They look alike. They talk a lot. They have the same kind of accent, um, you know, and, and um, you know, they just they ha they think alike. They do a lot of the same things and interests. But for the most part, for the most part, what I've encountered is incredible diversity, and even within a single, you know, nuclear family, everybody's very different. I can remember meeting several times when we're having a special, uh, special event at the church, and maybe somebody's siblings come that live in another state, and you're meeting them for the first time. And I can remember thinking in the back of my head, I didn't say this out loud, I hope I never did, I can remember thinking, saying, really? You're Bob's brother? <laughs> you know, because you're thinking... You're not at all like him, you know, and you don't look like you, you, you know, you're just so different. I can't believe y'all are from the same family. I've never met two people less alike. One family, and this is a family that I know with four, four grown adult children now, and those four adult children, one's a starving artist. I know that. That's what our older son is. One's a doctor. One's a model. And one, they don't even know where he is right now because he's struggled his whole life and sometimes he checks in every year or so but never they're never even sure that he's okay and all of those were raised in the same family unit same values same parents same environment so families are quite diverse for the most part, that's good because they have an incredible variety of gifts and incredible personalities that are each unique and contribute so much. See, God uses this. God created diversity and he uses it. I remember when a, a high school um, teen in, in the congregation suffered severe injuries from a car accident and he was in the hospital for months, you know, not just for a little while. And his mother actually quit her job to stay by his side day in and day out and there were two younger children. And then I watched the diversity of gifts come together because everything changed. You know, your emotional energy, your financial, you know, structure, everything you had. But the, young, the middle son in the middle of that had this bubbly personality, always positive, always upbeat. He could make the whole room laugh. And for all of that time, day in and day out, for the entire months, he kept everybody going just with his personality. His personality was a gift. He gave people hope. He moved them forward. The father had amazing organizational skills. That was his strength. So it didn't even take a week or two before he had gotten other people to take the two younger children to their school activities and to help them with their homework. Because all of a sudden, you know, they were really a one parent or a half a parent family because the other parent was living in the hospital all of the time. But everybody in the family brought something to the table. And they got through it. You know, I observe this in the church all the time. Some people cook delicious meals. Others offer rides to the doctor. Some find humorous cards. Some people know how to check in at just the right moment. You know, some people can finance a new ministry. Some people are wonderful at inviting others. You know, everybody brings their gifts to the table. You can't just belong. You have to participate. 
You have to, to be a part of it. So God gifts and uses people's diversity. You know, it amazed me when Hurricane Ian hit again, when I watched this, when tragedies happened, 42,000 linemen responded to the power outages almost immediately. 42,000. Can you imagine the coordination it took to do that? But I'd never want to be a lineman. Even when I was younger and healthy and 30 or 40, I wouldn't have wanted to be a lineman. That's not something I would have done. But then you've got your meter, meteorologist who often went to six years of, of school. And they're nerdy and they stayed behind a book, you know, and they know how to use the computer. And you've got your people in the shelters who are offering blankets and encouraging words and comforting and caring for people. God uses all of that. God uses all of that. God made humanity diverse. The body of Christ is diverse. In every congregation, there will be differing personalities, talents, gifts, opinions, ideologies. Because when we come together, we come from different families. We were raised in different homes. We have different priorities and different needs. God designed it that way. God wants to use that for good. He wants people to be, come together and use that for good. There is a radical interdependence in the body. Paul used the imagery of the body to explain that, that, that we need everybody. The, the eye can't say to the hand, I don't have any need of you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. You know, all you have to do is injure one part of your body to realize that it affects every other part of your body. You know, if you have a broken ankle, your whole schedule changes and your whole life changes. If you have a heart attack, everything changes. You know, I mean, it affects everything. God made each person indispensable, indispensable to the whole. So that's a timely lesson in two ways. If you're tempted to think that you're not important or you don't have much to offer, God just said otherwise. God just said that you, everybody sitting in this pew, is indispensable. We can't do without you. You contribute something important that the body will be less without you. God expects all of us to play our role, whether it's encourager or helper or financial backer or musician or teacher, you know, whatever it is, God expects us to play our role. And on the other side, if you're thinking, tempted to think too much of yourselves, Paul also said no. <laughs> he said that every part matters. That one part's not more important than the other. So it says, because that's what was happening in the Corinthian church. You'll find if you read the letters to Corinthians several times, they'll be in there, do not boast. <laughs> you know, you'll find that over and over, over again. So we're to approach one another with a spirit of humility, a great deal of respect, recognizing that everybody brings something that somebody can learn from. A keen sense of how much we need each other. In the next few Sundays, we're going to look at what God says to us about being the body of the Christ. The different things that he teaches us. Empathy. Communication. You know, seeking him first. Whatever else is clear, one thing is paramount about being the body of Christ. That Christ is the head. And that we need to rely on Christ more. We need every day to ask for his guidance and the equipping of his spirit. Because we can't do family well without God. We can't do the human family well without God. We can't do our biological families well without God. And we can't do church family without God. Equipping us and guiding us. So I want you to take this prayer planner home and pray. Please pray. It has all the different ministries and the staff and everyone here pray and take advantage of some of the activities. Maybe some of the things we suggest aren't things you would think of, but you're different and you're creative. That's why we need everybody. So you think of something that you can do that relates to that prayer and that prayer focus. And remember, there is a card for the children as well. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we need you. We need you as our head teaching us, instructing us. We need your spirit inside of us, equipping us, granting us wisdom, giving us courage, comforting us, healing us, correcting us. Lord, we can't do family well without you. 
So come, we're asking you to come and fill us once again. Amen. Our closing hymn is in your bulletin, God is so good. We'll follow it immediately with our choral benediction, Wings of Faith. Let's stand and close our service together. Join me in singing Wings of Faith. It's printed right below. God is so good. May you be in prayer to our Lord Jesus Christ that he will fill you and direct you and be close to you as you go through your week. Amen.